caught in the crossfire. Welcome everyone to the last and final episode of Man Cinema Reviews. This is a December release roundup. We're going to be covering five films today. I just want to express my gratitude and, and thanks for rocking with me for almost a full year now. I have 70 subscribers. I'm hoping to get those numbers way up. I was hoping to get 100, 100 subscribers by the end of this year. That's okay. I have a feeling that with more content coming up, uh, I still got two videos to hit with uh, for you for the 2021 film releases. I think you know which one those are, but I'll be simultaneously shooting and editing. So I got a lot on my plate right now, but I'm hitting you right before uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, this is gonna be uh, a fun video. And I just want to welcome everyone to the new year, 2022. Big things, baby. Thank you very much for choosing Man Cinema Reviews. Go ahead, if you're new to the channel, go ahead, press like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, notifying you of a new review posted. And I'm hopefully gonna adding more content. Uh, I got things in the works, wishful thinking and progression going forward. Thank you very much. We're gonna be covering five films today. Um, being Ricardo's, we have The Matrix, Resurrections, Licorice Pizza, we have Don't Look Up, and uh, Swan Song. Before we get started, we're gonna hit you with the new year. A little nervous. When am I ever nervous for a review? Here we go. Okay, so the first film that we're gonna be hitting you with is Being the Ricardos. This is written and directed by Aaron Sorkin. It is starring Nicole Kidman and Javier Bardem. This is set in 1952 um, for a tumultuous time for uh, Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball. Uh, I Love Lucy is in its second season. Uh, it's a tumultuous time with uh, tabloid stories of infidelity and Lucille Ball is actually being hit with ties to the Communist Party and this all leads up to the wrap-up of this one specific episode in a tumultuous week in uh, just the taping of this uh, episode. So what I liked off the bat uh, really quick, uh, Aaron Sorkin writing. Uh, he is just one of my favorite screenwriters and one of the best to do it ever in my opinion. Um, I have loved his transition into filmmaking. It's been a somewhat rocky and rough start. I mean, I feel like in his trajectory, he's got two other films in, in the can. Those films, I've seen glimpses of a, a, a filmmaker in the works and this film, it just feels like a lot of the production value, a lot of the cinematography, the editing, just the score and its severity being a biopic and a period piece at that. I feel like Aaron Sorkin is really stepping up to the plate in, in trying to create a visionary uh, auteur director uh, in his lane, uh, currently in his uh, career. This film is star studded. Uh, J.K. Simmons plays Frank Raleigh or uh, the, the the actor that played Fred Mertz. I'm not familiar with um, who played Viv, uh, the role of Ethel Mertz, but she was great as well. Um, just the, the cast and crew is phenomenal. I feel like the severity was paid attention to in this film. Uh, I, I believe that a lot of people were skeptic about Nicole Kidman stepping in when the uh, production of the film had Kate Blanchett starring as Lucille Ball. She had to leave the project. But I think Nicole Kidman uh, weaves her way in very naturally. There's a gradual you know, progression into uh, fully embodying the uh, role of Lucille Ball. Um, she's very kinetic. You, you know that Lucille Ball was a very physical, uh, comedic actress. Uh, she really wanted to become a serious, dramatic actress, but she was literally forced into playing Lucille Ball for millions, and it was a hit. I Love Lucy became a star-studded hit. 
Uh, it was in syndication, it's currently still in syndication for years. It just has stood the test of time. And I believe that her and Javier Bardem did what they could uh, in you know, becoming their respective roles. Uh, with Desi Arnaz, uh, Javier Bardem, great actor, nothing against him. I feel like the Cuban Pete was really kind of hammy at, at points. It feels like he was doing too much in certain scenes. And But even with that, I think that the two uh, main actors played well off each other. Uh, I really dug the chemistry between them and I could see why um, the daughter of Desi and uh, Lucy, uh, Lucille, uh, really loved both actors uh, playing uh, her parents. I think that these two worked well together and again, it was a, a gradual progression in seeing them step into their roles. And by the end of the film, I got wrapped up in it. I thought that the screenplay was top-notch, Aaron Sorkin, that's a given. But as far as direction, I believe that he has definitely stepped it up from his previous two films. Not to say that they weren't great, but they were just kind of standard films as far as filmmaking goes. This one, he has definitely broadened his scope. He's really stepping into becoming a serious auteur director, and I like that uh, progression for Aaron Sorkin as well. This is currently streaming on Amazon Prime and it's currently in theaters as well. I urge you to go see this and I'm giving this a solid four stars. I think it just played a little safe, but I, I really love the grandeur and homage to the film itself. Going on to The Matrix Resurrections. I had high hopes for this film. I, I tried not to uh, hype this film, but it, in its rollout of coming on HBO Max uh, and movie theaters, I was gonna go into the movie theaters, but with the spike of COVID cases going up, I stayed home and maybe that's why it affected my watch. Um, seeing it at home versus being in the theater experience with the big screen and the surround sound, I get pretty good surround sound with my sound bar, but it's just different, you know, it's just not the same um, experience. That being said, Lana Wachowski uh, is the sole director, the, which both Wachowskis did not come back to direct this film, so Lana has to pick up the reins and, and carry on this film. This film is uh, Neo as if he did not uh, choose the pill to go into the Matrix. This is him being a, a video game uh, creator, uh, creating the Matrix, and there's a lot of pushback for him to to bring it back, and it, it, it's a lot of retread. Um, Neo has to go back into the Matrix. Uh, we have new uh, characters and old ones coming back but not as the original characters and that was for Mr. Smith and Morpheus uh, but the two actors that stepped into their roles uh, did what they could it's just not the same to me I like the fact that Carrie Ann Moss and Keanu Reeves come back and their chemistry is phenomenal as ever when it was them in scenes together is what the core and the crux of this film is uh, for this to come out, you know, years later, uh, you know, decades later now, I feel like it's just a little too late. Um, unfortunately, I did not gel well with this uh, new film. Um, I, I see what Lana was doing. I like the fact that uh, it, it bigs up Yaya Mateen. He's having a great year. Christina Ricci is making a, a quasi comeback. I even liked her in this film. She is criminally underused. She's hardly in it, but what she had in this film, she stole the show. But unfortunately, I just thought it was a lot of retread and um, even bringing back scenes from the first film being projected in the background, literally in, the, in scenes. I just felt like if this is playing it as a greatest hits, you might as well just go back and watch the other films. And I loved the first Matrix, but with its 
eventual two sequels, uh, Reloaded and Revolutions, they were just lackluster, you know, uh, Reloaded a little bit better, Revolutions just being very weak and inconsistent. This film is even weaker and inconsistent to me. A lot of the fans, hardcore Matrix fans, love this film. They've been eating it up to death and I don't get it because it just feels lazy to me. Uh, Lana Wachowski, even if I said that the storyline was lackluster and a, a lot to be desired, at least the visual effects could make up for it. To me even, I, I know that they had to do reshoots on this film and you could feel it. I didn't even like the visual effects in this film. It, they just seemed cheesy or not as fully fleshed out as we've come to uh, know the Bachowskis to bring it. Even the bullet time, there's like two or three scenes where they, they, they emphasize bullet time. They, you know, and, and it's just a lot of retreat and a lot of just recycling being done here. And if I wanted that, I'd just go back and watch the original films. To do that it just feels like it cheapens out the audience and its core fans. But hey, if the core fans are eating it up, who am I to judge? If you like this film, that's great. Unfortunately, I did not like this film. I'm giving The Matrix Resurrections a one star, and it pains me to say this, but that's what it is. I was hoping to add this to my list as one of the best films. <sighs> it's just not gonna be there. Going on to the next film, Licorice Pizza, Paul Thomas Anderson. One of my favorite directors as well, being a writer, director, uh, just a visionary in his own bag director. He's an auteur director, one of my favorites. Uh, he's been pretty consistent um, with the exception of Inherent Vice, which I have yet to see fully. I think I tried to do that or three or four attempts and I've yet to master it. I, I cannot get myself to watch Inherent Vice all the way through. But with that being said, all of his other films have been great. Um, this film is an homage uh, to uh, 1970s, and a lot of his films are set in Southern California. This is set in the San Fernando Valley. Um, we have Cooper Hoffman, just a star-studded cast. Uh, Alana Haim, it's just a lot of young actors, burgeoning actors, coming up and they really make a name for themselves. And it's great to be under the tutelage of Paul Thomas Anderson. What better director can you have at the helm for one of your first films? And this also has Sean Penn. Uh, it also has veteran character actors in here. Um, it, it's a great uh, homage to the era uh, and it's basically about uh, these two teenagers growing up in the San Fernando Valley. Um, one, the, the male character is a, a hustler. He uh, likes to fancy himself as being an actor. And uh, Alana Hine, the female counterpart, is along the ride. Um, and she is with his antics. There's a lot of great banter she's older than uh, he is uh, he's definitely smitten um, but there is this nice love story at its core and you see the progression it's kind of an odyssey for these two to go through things growing up uh, different career paths d different motivations it's coming up in a tumultuous time where gas prices are rising and it's uh, you know a critical time in their lives, and also there's um, real life characters um, in the film playing a, a film producer, a a actor, aging actor, and a politician, and everybody is just going for gusto, you know. It, and it's it's great filmmaking. The only thing I have to say is that there is a, a controversial backlash with its depiction of Asian Americans and the two scenes that uh, are critical of this you know it, it's cringe you know and, it, and it's going for laughs but it, it really kind of pisses you off in those two scenes 
the thing is, I think it's trying to highlight the times, uh, definitely people's um, feelings back then, uh, definitely with older, you know, Caucasian uh, uh, audience. You know, that's just the way they talked or the way they dealt with uh, stereotypes. Uh, so I can't fault it for not being, you know, uh, true to the times. It's just very cringe, and that's probably my only um, criticism for this film. This is a l love story to its core, and it really brings Paul Thomas Anderson back into the game to where it's very reminiscent of Boogie Nights, and it, Boogie Nights happens to be my favorite of PTA. So I'm giving this a star-studded five stars, one of my favorite films of the year. And now we're going to Don't Look Up. It's currently on Netflix. This is a star-studded cast of Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, Timothy Chalamet, uh, Scott Muschietti, uh, Ariana Grande, uh, Meryl Streep, Jonah Hill. This is about two uh, Michigan State astronomers um, warning the uh, American people of an asteroid that will hit the Earth and it's definitely a political satire. You definitely get, uh, you know, the Trumpisms of Meryl Streep and being the Madam President, uh, hiring her son as Secretary of State, Jonah Hill. So with that banter, um, this is just a hodgepodge of political satire at the helm of Adam McKay. And Adam McKay came guns blazing with uh, the big short, which I loved. Uh, I was mixed to disagree with his take on uh, Dick Cheney and Vice. I thought that was a terribly inconsistent film. You see glimpses of greatness, especially with Christian Bale's performance, but that really took a nosedive. And unfortunately, this film does too. I feel like Adam McKay had, it was a flash in the pan moment for him with the big short. I really like uh, uh, him uh, being the showrunner of Succession. Um, stay in that bag, I guess, Adam McKay, because with you transitioning into more serious films, I mean, this is the mind of Anchorman and Talladega Nights. Um, you know, it's just that comedic banter works well with comedic actors. We have Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, Timothy Chalamet doing the best they can at comedic roles. Uh, it's great to have Jonah Hill really step it up with the, the comedy. Meryl Streep, surprisingly, I, I, I did not dislike, I'm just saying I like Meryl Streep, but she tends to be on the overrated side to me, but this was a very fun and spunky role for her to step into. And you know what? It took me three attempts. If you saw me on Twitter, I finally got it within the third attempt to watch this all the way through. I think the first time I was really tired and I saw it really late. The second time I gave it a honest, earnest watch and fell asleep halfway through. The third time I watched it all the way through. So you get where I'm at. I feel like this film, just like Vice, terribly inconsistent. There are moments of grandeur and there are moments of total aloofness that I did not gel with. Not saying that I, I don't like the political satire. Uh, I get the Trumpisms in here. Um, they just feel like they're pandering. It's terrible pandering uh, and obvious to on the nose. Um, I, I did like uh, Kate Blanchett as well. Uh, Tyler Perry was whatever, you know, it just got so much star power to it and everybody's trying to get their 15 minutes in. Um, I found that Leonardo DiCaprio, I did not care for in this film. Uh, I think this is him trying to step into comedic role. Uh, it just don't do it again, Leo. I don't like you in, in a role where you're a little bit more comedic. The biting satire just feels like it's pandering at this point. The Big Short took it with its full sincerity and this is just total aloofness and absurdity. But it's the sign of the times and it's craziness. So I get why there's a, an audience for it. It's just not with me. I'm gonna go ahead and it did get better on the third attempt, but I have to give this, I give this two stars. I didn't really care for it. Going on to the last film, which is Swan Song. Um, 
I have yet to see Nightmare Alley and The Tragedy of Macbeth. And in fact, I was trying to watch The Tragedy of Macbeth on Apple. Uh, currently, I don't have Apple, but I tried it. I get the free trial. Unfortunately, it doesn't come on until January 14th. But I did catch Swan Song. It's an Apple original starring Mahershala Ali, uh, Glenn Close, Adam Beach, and Naomi Harris. Uh, and it's like a quasi sci-fi drama. Uh, this is set in the future where a man has, Mahershala Ali's character has a terminal illness and he has to make a controversial decision of creating a doppelganger or clone of uh, just a carbon copy of himself to live on the rest of his life. He cannot tell his family uh, that he is sick and dying, so he has to make this controversial decision. This film caught me off guard. It is definitely a slow burn. It is at a, it's kind of a sluggish pace, but I like the art direction. The cinematography seems on point. You could tell that it has signs of ex machina. Mahershala Ali gives it, it his utmost um riveting performance to date uh if you loved him in moonlight you're gonna definitely love him because he is the main character he is the definite you know uh showstopper in this glenn close is great as well which is great to see glenn close being in a great film adam beach as her assistant um they're the ones that uh are cloning marshall ali you get a, a, a character from aquafina going through the same thing that Mahershala Ali is going through. Um, and Naomi Harris plays the wife. Uh, Naomi Harris had a twin brother uh, that you know passed away and she had a hard time dealing with his death. So Mahershala Ali, again, because he is terminally ill, does not want to break that news to his family for the blow it might have to his wife, especially he also has a young son um, he just doesn't want to burden his family. And again, you're with him throughout. It's an odyssey of one man's decision. So it feels very uh, intimate. It, it's definitely complex. But I really like a director that, that pays attention to the human condition. And you definitely get wrapped up in it. I would have to say that the third act left me depleted, obliterated. Emotionally, this is one of the best films that I've seen all year. And I have to say that the payoff is within the third act. I love this film. It's quickly becoming one of my favorite films of the year. Swan Song, for me, once you hit Frank Ocean with Moon River in the film, I'm crying and bawling like a baby. So with that said, I've never been this emotional in a film since Fruitvale Station. I think being a father, it definitely was a, you know, transformative watch for me and one that will stay with me for quite some time. I love this film. Swan Song gives a five star, full-fledged five for me. And I just implore you to watch it. If you have Apple TV, I mean, um, go ahead and it's streaming. I urge you to give it a watch. Thank you very much for rocking me this year. I've had such a fun time, phenomenal time with you. Can't wait to do it next year. Happy New Year, everyone. Peace.